Karachi is an enormous city. It's vast, it's busy, it's, it's hectic. There's almost 20 million people that live there. It's dusty, it's noisy. It's a city with real energy. It's also a city that's very difficult to make a film in. Into Dust is a film about the water crisis in Karachi, Pakistan. I guess you could see our film on two levels. On the, on the one level, as a human story, it's about the relationship between two sisters. On the other hand, fundamentally, this is a story about water, the scarcity of water in Pakistan, but that's a, a sort of a lens to look at the scarcity of water around the globe and the kind of things happening in Karachi today are the kind of things that lots of other cities could be facing in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Paveen Rahman was uh, an extraordinary woman working in a difficult part of Karachi, and she was somebody who dedicated her life to helping those less fortunate in society. Ever since she was a child, I mean, she would resist. If there was anything that was wrong, she would stand up. So, you know, as a kid, she'd stamp her foot and she'd stand up for that, you know? She had this, this stubbornness or whatever, you know, and she could not, she could not tolerate any kind of uh, unfairness. She worked for an NGO called the Orangi Pilot Project, and in her work, she came across two big things that were particularly unjust. That is the stealing of water and the theft of land. What happens is okay, the water is stolen through hydrants, you know, and this is then filled into tankers, and these tankers are then sold into uh, to the to the industries, mainly to industries. Uh, so that results in the water shortages in the poor areas. So the poorer areas then have to buy water, which is rightfully their own. They have to buy the water. Hundreds of millions of dollars were being siphoned out of the public water system every year and going into the pockets of criminals and people higher up in the chain who were in, you know, turning a blind eye to this or overseeing it. In the poorer neighbourhoods, people are only getting water sometimes once every 20 days. And the, the price they're paying for it is, is staggering. In Karachi, people can be spending up to 50% of their wage on water. Through meticulous recording and documentation, of how water was being stolen and who was stealing it, they were able to bring out a report quantifying it that this is what is supplied, this goes into the pipes of the citizens, and this is what is what does not, and this goes into the tanker. This was published, this was then launched in 2009, and this led to a lot of the illegal hydrants being demolished. She documented it in an irrefutable manner, so people could not dispute that there were illegal water hydrants in police stations. There were illegal water hydrants in schools. She was trampling on very, very powerful toes by doing all this. One day after leaving her office, about six o'clock, a motorbike pulled up alongside of her car and fired four bullets into it, and Paveen sadly was killed. We were all a bit shocked at how I guess little coverage internationally there'd been about her work and, and her death. Grunfoss is a global company from Denmark who manufacture water pumps, which are an essential part of the water infrastructure in many homes. Grunfoss is owned by a philanthropic foundation, the Grunfoss Foundation, um, and we partnered with them for this film. Our overall goal here is, as a company is to, to do better for the world and, and to, to leave it in a better shape than how we inherited it. This will be exciting. We have an obligation to solve some of the world's uh, biggest problems around uh, water scarcity and, and energy problems uh, or climate issues uh, around the world. We feel like that's an obligation and that comes all the way back from the, from the founder and that's why we have kind of built the company on, uh, on that foundation. I'm so fortunate I carry the name of the founder of Grundfos, also called Paul Duensen, which is my grandfather. Is this one good though? By 2030, we want to give clean drinking water to 300 million people that do not have access today. And that's, that's huge. We want to save our own CO2 emission in our company 
by 50% compared to what we had in 2008. And actually building a strong story here in a movie-based format. This is really about bringing the attention to the world around water scarcity. And these are just examples of us needing to, to contribute. It's needed. With increasing urbanization, our energy consumption grows, and CO2 emissions is a major driver for climate change. Combating climate change is about reducing CO2 emissions. Adapting to climate change is about water. I think we are already in a little bit of a crisis, uh, particularly in the developing world. You know, population growth increases in demand. If we sort of roll into that, the issues of climate change, then the situation is likely to get worse. Climate change is not only about too little water, areas where you have more intense droughts, but equally areas where they have more intense storms. The way in which we view water is very much based on a historical perspective. You know, it's a 19th century sort of thinking where we thought populations would remain relatively small. We thought that our resources were infinite and the environment was relatively benign. And so most of the infrastructure that we've constructed has been based on that principle there's a very clear recognition that if you're going to implement some infrastructure from the outset, you have to engage with people, you have to get them involved in the thinking around the design, around the construction of these systems, and you have to make them, you know, in a way that they can be managed and maintained by the local communities. You know, the magic really only takes place when everyone's in the room. The Orangi pilot project was set up in uh, 1980 uh, in Orangi to see what an organization could do to better the lives of the people because it was a squatter settlement, it was, the lanes were filthy, it was poverty stricken. My sister Parveen, she was an architect and she joined uh, OPP in 1982. There was no sewage disposal system, there was no water. The first priority was, of course, to clean up, to make the place a more healthy environment. Then it was to tell people, okay, look, you wait for the government to do this, it's not going to happen. We will teach you how to do this. And then OPP guided them on what, to, what material to buy, how to lay the trenches, how to create the trenches, how to lay the pipe, how to connect it to the manholes. And it was all possible because the system was so simple and it was possible economically because it was inexpensive. People were taught how to do this. If someone had come and done it for them, they could not have achieved, it would not be sustainable. Because you know, the lines that were laid in 1982 still function. You know, they, they, people maintain it because they've invested in it themselves. Now what began with one lane in 1982, now there are 7,000 lanes. And that is how Orangi from a squatter settlement of 800,000 people is now a thriving township of 2.3 million people. I think it's both a responsibility and a privilege when you're playing a, a real person. So it was, it was really wonderful to meet her. She's an older sister, you know, very protective of the younger sibling, and yet the younger sibling was somehow forging, you know, she was a pioneer and out there, and Akila was always trying to sort of not contain her, but protect her, you know. And now she's left with the legacy of that, and she feels it as a real, you know, it, it's a responsibility, she wants to honor it. It's very daunting, but it brings a lot of satisfaction. It brings, I can understand why she used to be happy because it makes me happy also, you know? When we make small achievements, when we are able to, uh, we are able to teach people how to do a certain thing, and we are able to help them better their lives. The UN has, has clearly stated that, that it's a human right to have access to, to not only water, but to drinking water, to clean drinking water. Uh, but honestly, in the world, that's not a fact. There's so many places where we do not have that. About 900 million people lack access to clean drinking water. And a 1,000 children die under the age of five every single day. 
because of unsafe drinking water and poor sanitation. And that's where we feel we have a strong obligation to help. It's terrifying to think how many cities in the next 30 years are going to be facing extreme water scarcity. And it doesn't just mean people not having enough water coming out of their taps. It, it also means criminalization. It means corruption in, in the government. It means the breakdown of law and order. It's, it's, it's a very scary situation that we're facing. OK, now they're going to carry the coffin through the streets, so we're going to follow that. Seeing all of the, uh, the actors and the assistants and, and all this that are, that are on the set, and uh, it's, it's done in such a natural way that I can simply not even tell the difference of who's actually real, you know, and, and, and who's in the film uh, itself. It's so authentic. It's, it's pretty wild. Uh, I'm, I'm actually here. I'm really touched about it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, and cut! Cut! But it just seems so real. I think the moments in the filming where actually I, I felt emotional were the moments where we were recreating what it's like to not have water in Karachi in real life. And there was a scene we filmed where water comes to a, a neighbourhood for the first time in 20 days. Just seeing that play out, it's really, really shocking. And that's what hundreds of thousands of people are going through every day. You know, often I think people at the moment, including myself, you feel very overwhelmed with global problems and you, you can be paralyzed into inaction because you don't know what you can do. I want people to think about their own water consumption habits. We've heard about our carbon footprint, but very few people know about your water footprints. Some of the innovations that are taking place, um, you see disruption on the horizon, but we can't you know, keep our eye off the ball. I mean, it, it, it really does require concentrated effort. I think it's a very urgent story, you know, that needs an audience on many levels. I mean, I think they will see a deeply personal story of a woman who's had so much empathy and compassion and was a pioneer and a leader and was murdered in such terrible circumstances, but who has left this enormous legacy. It's a fantastic story about, I would say, a, a freedom fighter for water. I think it's a story that needs to be told because it brings out huge awareness around the, some of the problems that the world is facing right now. You know, I want it to be a film about hope for the city, hope for the world, hope for uh, women and for nature, for the environment. There are things that you can do in your own life to make it better. There is cause for concern, but there is no cause to be despondent. There is a lot of hope.